Well, shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. And thank you, Hannah, once again for the beautiful, beautiful music. Thank you for blessing us with your talent. That was amazing, amazing. Okay, so tonight we are starting a, a new book from Josephus. This is book 15 of the Antiquities of the Jews. We're going to be reading a couple chapters tonight, seeing that the first chapter of that book is pretty small. Uh, so we will do that. And then I'm going to respond to some of the comments. I have some very interesting comments that I received in the, uh, from the comment section, especially on YouTube. Uh, and that reminds me, uh, I am not only on YouTube, I am on uh, many other platforms as once, uh, as well, at once, I should say. Uh, I got Jacob is cool from Twitch here, says, yo, and, and I'm on uh, TikTok as well. I'm on Kick. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Rumble, just to name a few. Okay, there's a few, there are several others as well. So if you are listening on another platform and you don't have me on YouTube or TikTok, uh, go on over to YouTube, look me up, Christopher Enoch, that is Christopher Enoch on YouTube. Uh, it should be the first thing that comes up and uh, make sure you got me over there as well as on TikTok as well. Or if you guys on YouTube or TikTok has, if you have any of these other uh uh, accounts if you're on any of these other platforms such as rumble even instagram if you wish um, i'm over on instagram as well uh, kick of course twitch facebook these kind of things uh, make sure you go over there and look me up over there as well christopher enoch just if you do a search for christopher enoch it should it should pop up uh, without a problem Okay, so as always, I pray that everything that we share here today would be a great blessing to you. Increase your knowledge of the scriptures, your knowledge of the things of heaven, your relationship with God, and your knowledge of the truth. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, if you have any questions, prayer requests, any questions in regards to God or the scriptures, uh, Jesus, anything like that, feel free to drop those in the live chat. Uh, we will do our best to, uh, to answer as much as we can. Uh, prayer requests, we'll jump on those prayer requests as, as soon as possible. So if you have any prayer requests, just uh, slip those in the live chat as well. We'll get to those ASAP. I know what it's like to want prayer, and uh, especially when it's a emergency or a, you know, a an urgent matter. And, uh, I know what it's like to put in a prayer request. It's like, did they get it? Did they, you know, did anybody actually pray? Uh, it, when will they pray like tomorrow, next week? You don't know. So I know what it's like to be in that position. So this is the reason why we put a great em emphasis on all your prayer requests. We'll get to those ASAP. All right. Uh, all right. So Let's see what we have in the, in the live chat before we jump into this. Kalamentos says, Shalom to all. Shalom, Kalamentos. Welcome. Blessings. Blessings. Randy says, Shalom. Shalom, Randy. Welcome and blessings multiplied to you and yours. And we have Billy. Billy says, Shalom. Shalom, Billy. Welcome and blessings multiplied to you and your family as well. Okay. Okay. Just before we get into this, uh, Josephus uh, if God puts it on your heart to share the live stream with anybody, share the live stream and, uh, you know, get the message out there, share the link, send a text, a message, post it on your, uh, social media, whatever you feel led to do. So here's the, uh, breakdown for, for the night. I'm going to read a couple chapters this time of Josephus, mainly because the first chapter is very, well, fairly short. I, I, I don't remember actually. And there might have been a time, it's hard to remember whether there was a chapter this short before in, in Josephus or not. But this is a fairly short chapter, and chapter 2 is not, not that short, but we'll, we'll read both of those uh, as, uh, as we go along here. We've been plugging away at this Antiquities of the Jews for quite some time. I want to get this finished, and maybe, Lord willing, we'll get into uh, the other volume of books that Josephus wrote called the, uh, uh, what is it now? The Wars of the Jews. Uh, if not that, something else interesting, for sure. We're always doing it. We read through the entire Bible already. Many places we read over countless times. 
uh, as much as uh, we also read the uh, uh, Apocrypha, various forms of the Apocrypha, various books of the Apocrypha, of different Apocryphas, I, I should say, all the way up to you know, three, four Maccabees, some of the books that they're not found in, in the typical Apocrypha. So we read through all those and, and uh, some of the Pseudepigrapha as well, such as the Book of Enoch and, and such like that as well. Okay, so the schedule of the night is I'm going to read these two chapters. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to respond to your comments. I did leave a few replies to a few comments earlier. If you're in the background there, if you are listening to this, and if I replied to your comment saying that I will feature your comment tonight or that I will read and respond to your comment tonight, that I will do after the reading of Josephus. And then we're going to get into a little bit of critical thinking talk as well. Tonight's going to be a very interesting one because there's something called the ad hoc rescue fallacy, which is also known as the making stuff up fallacy. So we'll talk about that. We get this all the time. A lot of people just make stuff up just to just to justify their beliefs, you know. So we'll talk about this a little bit later as well. So we'll get to that after the comments. And then at the very end, we'll get to the um, critical thinking quiz as well. Okay, let's do this. We're, we are on book 15. So this is book 15. Uh, Flavius Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, book 15, and we're going to start with chapter 1. Well, the book here says it's um, containing the interval of 18 years from the death of Antigonus to the finishing of the temple by Herod. Chapter 1, concerning Polio, or Polio and Simaeus, Herod slays the principal of Antigonus's friends and spoils the city of its wealth. Antony beheads Antigonus. Paragraph 1. How Sosius and Herod took Jerusalem by force, and besides that they took Antigonus captive, has been related by us in the foregoing book. We will now proceed in the narration, and since Herod had now the government of all Judea, put into his hands, he promoted such of the private men in the city as had been of his party, but never left off avenging and punishing every day those that had chosen to be of the party of his enemies. But Pollio the Pharisee and Simaeus, his a disciple of his, were honored by him above all the rest. For when Jerusalem was besieged, they advised the citizens to receive Herod. For which advice they were well requited. But this Pollio, at the time when Herod w was once upon his trial of life and death, foretold in a way in way of reproach to Hyrcanus and the other judges how this Herod, whom they suffered now to escape, would afterward inflict punishment on them all, which ha uh, which had its completion in time while God fulfilled the words he had spoken. Paragraph 2. At this time, Herod, now he had gotten uh, Jerusalem under his power, carried off all the ro royal ornaments and spoiled the wealthy men of what they had gotten. And when, by these means, he had heaped together a great quantity of silver and gold, he gave it all to Antony and his friends that were about him. He also slew 45 of the principal men of Antigonus' party and set guards at the gates of the city that nothing might be carried out together with their dead bodies. They also searched the dead and whatsoever was found, either silver or gold or other treasure, it was carried to the king. Nor was there any end of miseries he brought upon them. And this distress was in part occasioned by the covetousness of the prince regent, who was still in want of more, and in part by the sabbatic year, which was still going on, and forced the country to lie still uncultivated, since we are forbidden to sow our land in that year. Now when Antony had received Antigonus as his captive, he determined to keep him against his triumph, 
But when he heard that the nation grew seditious and that out of their hatred to Herod, they continued to bear good will to Antigonus, he resolved to behead him at Antioch. For otherwise the Jews could no way be brought to be quiet. And Strabo of Cappadocia attests to what I have said. When he thus speaks, quote, Antony ordered Antigonus, the Jew, to be brought to Antioch and there to be beheaded. And this Antony seems to me to have been the very first man who beheaded a king, as supposing he could no other, no other way bend the minds of the Jews so as to receive Herod, whom he had made king in his stead. For by no torments could they be forced to call him king, so great a fondness they had for, the, for their former king. So they thought that this dishonorable death would diminish the value they had for Antigonus' memory, and at the same time would diminish the hatred they bear to Herod. Thus far Strabo. Chapter 2. How Hyrcanus was set at liberty by the Parthians and returned to Herod, and what Alexandra did when she heard that Anna, Ananellus, Ananellus was made high priest. Paragraph 1. Now after Herod was in possession of the kingdom, Hyrcanus the high priest, who was then a captive among the Parthians, came to him again and was set free from his captivity in the manner following. Barsapharnes and Pacorus, the generals of the Parthians, took Hyrcanus, who was first made high priest and afterward king, and Herod's brother Phasaelus captives, and were them and were them away into Parthia. Parthia, excuse me. Phasaelus indeed could not bear the reproach of being in bonds, and thinking that death with glory was better than life whatsoever be, better than any life whatsoever, he became his own executioner, as I have formerly related. Paragraph two. Now when Hyrcanus was brought into Parthia, the king Phraates treated him treated him after a very gentle manner, as having already learned of what an illustrious family he was, on which account he set him free from his bonds and gave him a habitation at, at Babylon, where there were Jews in great numbers. These Jews honored Hyrcanus as their high priest and king, and did all the, nation, the Jewish nation that dwelt as far as, as Euphrates, which respect was very much to his satisfaction. But when he was informed that Herod had received the kingdom, new hopes came upon him, as having been himself still of a kind disposition towards him, and expecting that Herod would bear in mind what favor he he had received from him, and when he was upon his trial, and when he was in danger that a capital sentence would be pronounced against him, he delivered him from that danger, and from all punishment. Accordingly, he talked of that matter with the Jews that came often to him with great affection, but they endeavored to retain him among them, and desired that he would stay with, with them putting him in mind of those uh, of the kind offices and honors they did him, and that those honors they paid him were not at all inferior to what they could pay to either their high priests or their kings, and what was a greater motive to determine him, they said, was this, that he could not have those dignities in Judea because of that may of that maim in his body which had been inflicted on him by Antigonus. And the kings do not use to requite men for those kindnesses which they received when they were private persons, the height of their fortune making usual, usually no small changes in them. Paragraph 3. 
Now, although they suggested these arguments to him for his own advantage, yet did Hyrcanus still desire to depart. Herod also wrote to him and persuaded him to desire for Ates and, and the Jews that were there, that they should not grudge him the royal authority, which he should have jointed with himself, for that now was the proper time for himself to make him amends for the favors he had received from him, as having been brought up by him and saved by him also, as well as for Hyrcanus to receive it. And as he wrote thus to Hyrcanus, so did, the, so did he send also Saramalas, his ambassador to Phraates, and many presents with him. He desired him in the most obliging way that he would be no hindrance to his gratitude towards his benefactor. But, his zeal, but this zeal of Herod's did not flow from that principle. But because he had made governor, excuse me, but because he had been made governor of that country without having any just claim to it, he was afraid, and that upon reasons good enough, of a change in his condition, and so made haste he could get Hyrcanus into his power, or indeed uh, to, to put him quite out of the way, which last thing he compassed afterwards. Paragraph 4. Accordingly, when Hyrcanus came, full of assurance, by the permission of the king of Parthia, at the expense of the Jews, who supplied him with money, Herod received him with all possible respect and gave him the, pro the upper place at public meetings and set him above all the rest at feasts and thereby deceived him. He called him his father and endeavored by all the ways possible that he might have no suspicion of any treacherous design against him. He also did other things in order to secure his government, which yet occasioned a sedition in his own family, for being cautious how he made any illustrious person the high priest of God, he sent for an obscure priest out of Babylon, whose name was Ananelus, and bestowed the high priesthood upon him. Paragraph 5. However, Alexandra, the daughter of Hyrcanus and wife of Alexander, the son of Aristobulus the king, who had also brought Alexander two children, could not bear this indignity. Now this was one of the greatest comeliness and was, was called Aristobulus, and the daughter Miriam, or Miriam Ne, was married to Herod, and, uh, and eminent for her beauty also. This Alexandra was much disturbed, and took this indignity offered to her son exceedingly ill, exceeding ill, that while he was alive, any, any one else should be sent for to have that the dignity of the high priesthood conferred upon him. Accordingly, she wrote to Cleopatra, a musician assisting her in taking care to have her, her letters carried, to desire her intercession with Antony in order to gain the high priesthood for her son. Paragraph 6. But as Antony was slow in granting this request, his friend Delius came into Judea upon some affairs. And when he saw Aristobulus, he stood in admiration at the tallness and handsomeness of the child, and no less at Miriam, the king's wife, and was open to his commendations of Alexandra as the mother of most beautiful children. And when she came to discourse with him, he persuaded her to get pictures drawn of them both and to send them to Antony, for that when he saw them, he would deny her nothing that she, would, that she should ask. Accordingly, Alexandra was elevated with these words of his and sent the pictures to Antony, 
Delius also talked extravagantly and said that these children seemed not deprived from men, but from some god or other. His design in doing so was to entice Antony into lewd pleasures with him, who was ashamed to send for the damsel as being the wife of Herod, and avoided it because of the reproaches he should have, he should have from Cleopatra on that account. But he sent in the most decent manner he could for the young man, but added this withal, unless he thought it hard upon him to do so, so to do. When this letter was brought to Herod, he did not think it safe for him to send one so handsome as was Aristobulus in the prime of his life, for he was sixteen years of age, and of, and of so noble a family, and particularly not to Antony, the principal man among the, the Romans, and one that would abuse him in his armors, and besides, one that openly indulged himself in such pleasures as his power allowed him without control. He therefore wrote back to him that if this boy should only go out of the country, all would be in a state of war and uproar, because... The Jews were in hopes of a change in the government and to have another king over them. Paragraph 7. When Herod had thus excused himself to Antony, he resolved that he would not entirely permit the child or Alexandra to be treated dishonorably. But his wife Miriam lay vehemently at him to restore the high priesthood to her brother, and he judged it he judged it was for his advantage to do, so to do because if he once had that dignity, he could not go out of the country. So he called his friends together and told them that Alexandra privately conspired against his royal authority and endeavored by the means of Cleopatra so to bring it about that he might be deprived of the government and that by Antony's means, this youth might have the management of public affairs in his stead, and that this proce procedure of hers was unjust, since she would at the same time deprive her daughter of the dignity she now had, and would bring disturbances upon the kingdom, for which he had taken a great deal of pains, and had gotten it with extraordinary hazards, that yet, while... He well remembered her wicked practices. He would not leave off doing what was right himself, but would even now give the youth the high priesthood, and that he formerly set up Ananelus, because Aristobulus was then so very young a child. Now when he had said this, not at random, but as he thought with the, with the best discretion he had, in order to deceive the women, and those friends whom he had taken to consult with all, Alexandra, out of the great joy she had at this unexpected promise, and out of fear from the suspicion she lay under, fell a-weeping, and made the following apology for herself, and said that, as to the high priesthood, she was very much concerned for the disgrace her son was under, and so did her utmost endeavors to procure it for him but that but that as to the kingdom she had made no attempts and that if it were offered her for her son she would not accept it and that now she would be satisfied with her son's dignity while he himself held the civil government and she had thereby the security that arose from his pe peculiar ability in governing to all the remainder of her family, that she was now overcome by his benefits and thankfully accepted of this honor, showed him, or showed by him to her son, and that he, uh, she would hereafter be entirely obedient. She desired him to excuse her if the nobility of her family and the freedom of acting which she thought that allowed her had made her act too precip 
precipitately and imprudently in this matter. So when they had spoken thus to one another, they came as an agreement and all suspicions so far as appeared were vanished away. All right, so that's the reading for tonight, the Josephus reading. Uh, Tomorrow, Lord willing, we will read chapter 3, how Herod, upon his making Aristobulus high priest, took care that he should be murdered in a little time. And what apology he made to Antony about Aristobulus, as also concerning Joseph and Miriam. Child of One True King says Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, child of one true king. Blessings, blessings multiplied to you. That's not not Shabbat yet. Expose says shalom, 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 shalom. Expose, welcome, and blessings multiplied to you. Shalom, shalom. Yes. Flow says blessings, everyone. Blessings, flow. Welcome, blessings, blessings multiplied to you and your family. Seek the Lord says, Shalom, Shalom, seek the Lord, welcome, blessings, blessings. Qbert says, Hello, blessings all. Hello, Qbert's, blessings, blessings, multiplied to you. John, good to see you, blessings and Shalom multiplied to you. John, I promise, there's a couple people I promised that I would get to their their, uh, comments um, even before the live stream uh, commenced. So I'll get to those, I'll get to their comments and then I'll come back to you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I did. There has been a few people that I uh, that I replied to promising them beforehand that I would get to their comments. And so let's do it. Now. Okay. So these comments, I, I what I did was I, I, I clipped um, a, a few comments to put to put it in context. Uh, and this, these comments were left on an, an older video. Actually, you can see right here that these comments were like two years old. But this one that I received was just like a, a week ago. Uh, and this is the one that I specifically want to reply to. But just to give some a little bit of context here, uh, we have Willis saying, Read King James Version. Peter backslid for a moment and Paul set him straight. This is why Paul was special. He wasn't Jew and went hard spreading everywhere whatever that means not saying the others didn't but paul unique so the context here is that we're talking about what paul said about peter in galatians chapter 2. so i replied this was two years ago so you know i i change it i i learn as we go along so uh, let's see what I said two years ago here. I said that was Paul's side of the story. Uh, we'd be foolish to draw conclusions without hearing Peter's side. Yes. Uh, remember, Paul contradicted Peter even in this same chapter, verse 7. Paul said that he is called to the Gentiles while Peter's ministry is to the Jews. But in Acts 15, verse 7, Peter said the opposite. Peter said that God chose him to preach to the Gentiles. So, even though that's two years old, I, uh, I, uh, I fully endorse everything that I said two years ago there. I think that's, uh, I believe that's all true. I approve this message. So, we have this person here that replied just last week. So, this person says, so Paul the Apostle wasn't lying about Peter and Peter didn't mention this, LOL? Oh, excuse me. So Paul the Apostle was lying. I said it wasn't. So Paul the Apostle was lying about Peter, and Peter didn't mention this. Okay. So there are some premises in this question that is baked in here that uh, does not apply to the situation. So in Acts chapter 15, keep in mind, Peter did not write Acts. It is commonly believed that it was Luke. We don't know. I mean, who knows for sure who wrote it, but it's commonly believed to be Luke. I think 
it seems to me, yes, the, 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 the author of the Gospel of Luke and the author of the book of Acts, to me, seems to be the same author. It's like volume one, volume two. So in Acts chapter 15, verse seven, Peter did not write that. It was Luke that wrote that. And so Luke is saying that Peter said this, which contradicted Paul. Now that's substantial. That is substantial because when you got someone like Luke, which was one of Paul's best friends, say something that, or at least present evidence that seemed to be against Paul, that speaks volumes. That speaks volumes. Because you could expect Luke to stick up for Paul all the way. I hope he, you know, Paul, or Luke being Paul's best friend, you know, would be, would do exactly what any good best friend would do. And that is stick up for you, right? Uh, you know, that's it. it. And so I would expect Luke. And I think that he did to a, to a great degree. I think that, that Luke did stick up for Paul through much of the book of Acts. But we do have some stuff in Acts chapter 15 and in Acts chapter 21 to name a few, that would give us the idea that there, that Luke, uh, well, he, he said some things that kind of shed a little bit of, put a little shadow on Paul uh, in a way. I think that's very substantial because if Luke is the friend that he is purportedly to be, uh, then if he said anything negative or at least implied anything negative about Paul, then you could probably, you could probably assume, safely assume that the, the real story of Paul is much worse, much worse than what we got written in uh, in the book of Acts, there's this thing called the criteria of embarrassment, meaning that if you say something that might embarrass you, it's pro the truth is probably much worse. And the same goes with those friends of yours. If you have best friends or if you have people that are very close to you that love you very much and they say something that would embarrass you, the truth of the matter is probably much worse. So the way we have Luke saying that Peter spoke up in the presence of them all, including Paul, that Peter proclaimed himself to be the apostle that God chose to go to the Gentiles. And Paul said nothing in reply to that. Like, Peter, you say it. Okay. You know, so Peter in, the, in Acts chapter 15, Paul is silent about that which also speaks volumes, let alone the fact that according to Luke, I'm, cho I'm choosing my words carefully here. According to Luke, Peter said something in Acts chapter 15, verse seven, namely that he was the apostle to the Gentiles, that God chose him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, more or less, which goes against what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, because Paul said, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews, or uh, explicitly or specifically, he said, I'm the apostle to the uncircumcised, Peter to the circumcised, which again, there's, so we can see that Peter and Paul are button heads here. Paul says one thing and Peter says the, the opposite. So, I wouldn't frame it like this. I wouldn't say that Paul was lying about Peter. I mean, if you really want to be, you know, blunt with 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 Paul, yeah, go ahead and say it. Peter or Paul was lying about Peter. But here's the thing. How do you know that Peter didn't mention it? 
how do you know that even Peter knew about the book of Galatians? Peter might not have even have ever known about the book. The book of Galatians was not written to be in the Bible. The book of Galatians was literally a letter, literally an epistle, which is a fancy word that means letter, just means a letter, a letter that Paul wrote to, the, uh, to his buddies in Galatia. He didn't write that to Peter. Peter may not have ever saw that letter. So how, how do you, to this person here, I got a question, a couple questions. I want to know what your answer is. Number one, how do you know that Peter knew about Galatians? And don't tell me, don't make stuff up. Don't make a claim without showing me evidence. How do you know that Peter knew about Galatians? The New Testament, as we see it today, didn't exist for a long time. It did not exist in the first century. It wasn't until the second century when Marcion, the heretic, the so-called uh, firstborn of Satan, started compiling Paul's letters together. This is the history of your Bible. According to church historian, New Testament historian, Dr. Jason Badoon. We touched on all these things last year, 2023, and July 17th and July 18th. So, number one, how do you know that Peter even knew about the, uh, what, what Paul wrote about him? Maybe he did not know. Okay? Tell me that. They're, I'll just call you... I don't know how to, uh, I don't want to mispronounce your name uh, or your uh, username here. So I'm not going to, re I'm not going to even attempt to it out of respect, but I'm going to ask you here to show me evidence that Peter even knew about it. Common sense should tell you if Paul says the opposite to what Peter said, comparing Galatians 2 with Acts 15, that should tell you that one of them is wrong. Or if you really want to be gracious, you can say that, well, maybe perhaps we have misinterpreted it somehow. But it seems to be pretty clear. Paul said in Galatians 2, 7, he said, I'm, I'm the apostle to the, to the, to the uncircumcised, i.e. the Gentiles, while Peter is the apostle to the circumcised. That would be the Jews. Whereas P Peter said the opposite in Acts chapter 15. Written by Luke. So number one, how did Peter know? Because this, this question assumes that Peter knew, knew. This question here assumes that Peter knew. First of all, he would have to know in order, to, in order to respond to it, right? How did he know? Number two. If he knew, how do you know he didn't respond to it? Because he, he doesn't have to put it in writing. It's not like every... How do you know he didn't respond to it? Maybe he did. How do you know? Maybe he really lashed in to, to Paul about it. Because you see, Paul is saying, oh, but Peter is, is being like a Gentile among the Gentiles and like a Jew among the Jews, yada, yada, yada. It's like the way it sounds, the way it reads, is like Paul is accusing Peter of doing what he actually said that he does. He is a Jew to the Jews and a Gentile to the Gentiles. He's like one under the law amongst those who are under the law and like those who are not under the law amongst those who are not under the law. Is that not what he said? So, how do you know that Peter didn't respond to that? He could have responded in person. He could have responded... He could have, he, he could have responded in word, uh, not in writing. He could have responded verbally. Number three, if you think that Peter had to write it down, how do you know he could write? Oh, but what about 1 Peter and 2 Peter? Don't give me that. Okay? It says in Acts chapter 4 that Peter was agramatos. 
in the in the Greek literally means that he was illiterate that he did not know how to read and write it's what it literally means in its in its literal context. So that coupled with the fact that fishermen in the first century were not well, were not educated men. As you, another thing you see in the book of Acts is that Peter was not educated. So the fact that it says Peter was agramatos, the fact that, historically speaking, fishermen were not educated, meaning they were more than likely not taught how to read and write anyway in the first century. Couple that with the fact that we have uh, some of the leading Bible scholars in the world today that believe that First and Second Peter were not written by Peter, but they were forgeries, especially Second Peter. So, how do you know Peter could write? And what do you expect? Where did you expect him to write? And if he did write, how do you know it's, it was included in the Bible? There are several questions for you which I would, I'm interested in knowing the answers to. So the apostle Peter was lying and uh, about Peter and Peter didn't mention this? Lol? That's a straw man. That's not what I claimed. That's not what I claimed at all. That's a straw man fallacy. I did not claim that. I did not say that. So who are you arguing with? That's my last question for you. Who are you arguing with? Because that's not what I said. That's not what I claimed. I'm looking forward to your answers. Here's another uh, one. Uh, for those of you who love God, those of you who love our wonderful Father, and you love His instructions, you love to do what pleases Him, you be sure to get this kind of objection at one point or another. Maybe you've already heard this a million times over, but here you go. It is, how is observing the whole law going for you? Honest question. With that, I'm going to answer with some scripture first. Let's go to Luke. I know a lot of you, you're going to, you're going to know what I'm going to, uh, you know what I'm going to go to. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, talking about John the Baptist's parents, okay? There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. Both righteous. Oh, there we go again. Luke, Luke, are you kidding me? Luke is saying that there were, there were actually righteous people before God, before Jesus. Yes. Oh, but Paul said, but, but Paul said, but Paul said there's no none righteous, no, not one. Really? Who's wrong? Paul or Luke? And by the way, we have well over a hundred times throughout the scriptures of God himself talking about righteous people. If righteous people don't exist, it would be absurd. I would say it's either we're interpreting Paul wrong or Paul is just simply wrong. Anyways, that's just a little bit of a rabbit trail there. So uh, they were both righteous before God, walking in how many of, uh, 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 let me zoom in a little bit here for you. Maybe you're on a mobile device. How many of the commandments are Zechariah and Elizabeth walking in here? How many? Does it say, well, you know, good old Zechariah, he tried his best to walk in all the commandments, oh my, but he just couldn't because it's just too hard for him because the law is only there to show you how much of a sinner you are. You just to bang you over the head and just to put you down to show you how much of a sinner you are, how much you need Jesus. Is that what it says here? 
did did Zechariah walk in all the commandments? It says he did. Not only him, but Elizabeth too. They, Zechariah and Elizabeth, this is in verse 6, walking in all the commandments. Now, it, it could have said, well, Zechariah, he was just a very, very strong, godly, holy man, and he did it, albeit he went through some hard times. It was easier to climb Mount Everest than it was to obey all the commandments for, for Zechariah. But Elizabeth, well, she tried her best, but she still, she, she, she missed it, you know? Like she just couldn't get it. Is that what it says? It talks about walking in all the commandments of God as if it's just a very easy thing to do, you know? Like as if it's a everyday kind of thing. And indeed it is. It's not hard to obey the commandments. It's not hard. And don't give me this, well, did you obey all 613? Well, when you talk about 613, because I, I get, you get this all the time, right? So when you talk about 613, where you get that from? You know, these, these, these Christians don't even know where they get that from. They just heard their parrot parrot that to them, the parrot that parroted from the other parrot that parroted from the other parrot down the line, but they don't even know where it's from. Let me tell you where it's from. It's from the Talmud. You're actually preaching Talmud if you go there. You're actually relying on Talmud you know, the very book that you say, or the very collection of books, I should say, that you reject saying that, oh no, it's all wrong. But you actually pick, cherry pick that one little thing out of the Talmud because you can, you can hijack that for your own advantage, for, the, for your own narrative, right? According to Chabad.org, one of the most famous Jewish websites on, on the internet today, it says that there are Jewish scholars that disagree with that number. It's not in the Bible. That 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 number is not in the Bible. That was that's in the Talmud, and even even Jewish scholars disagree with that number. So why do Christians pick up on it so much? I can't think of any other reason other than it just goes, they, they use that as a weapon to wield, to, to further their, their own narrative. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth lived before Jesus was born. They lived before Jesus was born. And it says they walked in all the commandments. Now you think that's impossible? How about this? Not just all the commandments, but the ordinances as well. All the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. In other words, they could not even, you couldn't even point a finger at them and blame them for anything because they didn't, they didn't disobey. They got it all down. If they can do it without Jesus, how much more can you do it with Jesus? If they can do it without Jesus, how can you say, I can do all things through Christ, and, but at, at, at the same time saying that you can't walk in all the commandments? What? I can do all things through Christ except obey God. What kind of faith is that? except obey the law of God. Oh, I can do all things through Christ except obey the Torah. No, I can't do that. I can't obey the law of God because it's just too hard. That's a lie. God himself said that it's easy. It's not too hard. It's a lie. Do not go with the lie. So in answer to this, how is observing the whole law going for you? Honest question. It's beautiful. It's amazing. You need to join me. You can do it. It's so easy. It's so easy. And there's not 613 laws you must obey. Don't believe that nonsense from some of these evangelicals that tell you that. Don't believe that. That's not true. Because 
whatever the number is, whether it's 600, 700, or 500, or whatever the case is, most of those laws do not apply to you. They're for, they're, they're for the priests, the Levites. M most of them, a good part of them are. Some of them are for men, not for women. So if, you, if you're a, a woman, then the, the, of course the, the commandments for men don't apply to you and vice versa. If you're a man, the commandments for, the, for women don't apply to you. Some commandments are only for farmers. If you're not a farmer, then those commandments don't apply to you. It's really simple. God does not require you to do anything that you cannot do. That's a tyrant. That's an unreasonable tyrant. God's not like that. Our Father is wonderful, loving. He is so awesome and beautiful. He is the, he is the great and awesome God. Cindy over there on TikTok. Cindy says, Hi, mister. I love you. How are you doing? You're doing amazing. Thank you. Yes, God is good all the time. Oh, Amen. Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate that. You're amazing as well. I appreciate I appreciate you guys. I really appreciate you guys so much. You know that? You guys that are that are um uh, supporting with positive feedback and all that kind of stuff. It really means a lot to me. It really does. Appreciate all you guys as well over there on YouTube as well. You guys are amazing. Yeah. One of these days, you know, Lord willing, we'll, we'll meet in, in person and it'll just be an awesome time. We'll have, we'll have, we'll have lots of fun. Lots of fun. All right. Uh, yeah. So to answer your question here, uh, Mark, uh, how is observing the whole law going for you? Well, uh, assuming that you know that when you say whole law, what you mean is all the commandments that apply to me. Okay. How is it going for me? Easy, beautiful, lovely. It's awesome. Read Psalm 119. Read Psalm 119. You will see how much David loves the law, how much he... He praises the law to it to the it's like the law that's more precious than gold, more beautiful than the finest of the precious of precious gems, sweeter than honey, a law that causes him to rejoice. Oh, how I love your law, he declares over and over and over again. He says that tears like rivers flow out of his eyes because of those who do not obey it. It's the law of liberty, the law of love. It's the law of God. It's even according to Paul, even according to Paul, it is holy, just, and good. How, how else does that kind of stuff go for anybody? If you decide to follow the law that's holy, just, and good, you are on a good path. I tell you, you're on a good path. Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate that. You guys are amazing. You're amazing. Yeah, lots of love. Appreciate that. Yeah, okay. One more comment that I, re that I promised that I would uh, respond to uh, before I move on here. And I'll answer John's question in the live chat. So, uh, Robert says, um, well, it's just a quote, actually, from Galatians. Speaking of Galatians chapter 2, here we are. He know that no one is justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. Okay. Here's the thing. There's, um, actually, there's, a, there's about three major points here. There's about three major points here. Uh, and I, I'm not scripted here, so I'm just going to be talking just off the cuff here because it, um, it's all spontaneous and such. So, the book of James, the epistle of James, says that James chapter 2, verse 24 says, 
You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That's what James 2.24 says. And I'll quote this again because I've read it so many times that I memorized it. James said, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Many scholars believe that James was rebutting the uh, Galatians chapter two, when he or Galatians chapter three, especially when he was uh, when he wrote that. But you know, there 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 are some Christians that say to me, "Oh well, you know, uh, we don't go by James because James it says to it says in James chapter one that that it's for the twelve tribes scattered abroad. So the, we're not Jews, so we don't go by the Epistle of James. Believe it or not, I've had people say that to me." I've had a number of people actually use that as an excuse. Now, I got to give credit where credit's due because those who actually say that, they acknowledge that James contradicts Paul. They acknowledge that or else they wouldn't say that. They wouldn't say, oh, I don't go by that because that's for the Jews. That's not for the Gentiles. Paul's my man. I go for the Gentiles. I go with Paul. You know, I go with his teachings. And that's what I've been told, which is not true, by the way. And, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say what they said. So they say, well, we're not part of the 12 tribes. We're not of the children of Israel. We're the Gentiles, so it doesn't belong to us. A couple problems with that. If you are not part of the 12 tribes, then the New Testament is not for you. You might as well, you might as well just throw out the New Testament completely. How could you say that, Christopher? How could you say that? I'll tell you how I could say that. You read it in in Jeremiah chapter 31, in Hebrews chapter 8. You read it. What did God say? I will make a new covenant with who? With Israel and with Judah. Right? With the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. He didn't say with the Gentiles. So the whole entire New Testament is only for the Israelites. On top of that, if you believe, if you're a Christian and you believe your Bible, believe Roman, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 21, it says that the final destination for the Christian, the New Jerusalem, has 12 gates. In other words, you have to enter Jerusalem through one of those gates. There's no other gates to get in. Only one of the 12. It says, there are 12 gates, one gate for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Newsflash for you. There's no Gentile gate. Which gate are you going to go through? So if you're part of Israel, then James is for you too. You can't throw James out. See, a lot of Christians just try to make James work with Paul because they say, oh, no, they're not contradictory. I think that that is very much in denial, actually. But the people who say James is only for the 12 tribes, so I don't go by that, at least they're a little bit closer to the truth. I mean, they're not there yet, but they're closer because they have acknowledged within themselves that James actually does contradict Paul. And they use that excuse to get out of it. Oh, I'm not part of the 12 tribes. That's not for me. Okay, so then... Galatians is not for you either because you're not part of the church in Galatia, are you? Because the, the, the entire book of Galatians is not for you. It doesn't say to, to Robert or to Christopher or anybody else here. It doesn't say Paul to Robert or Paul to the believers in America. You know, he didn't, he didn't say that. It was only for those in Galatia. How do we know? Because he said it. It's right there. Galatians chapter 1. So we don't know the context of this letter. We know that Paul did his missionary journeys. He traveled around and he must have. I think it's fair to say that 
that he met a, a fair amount of people. And, and so he had conversations and relationships with these people. So there were contexts that we don't know about. I think that a lot of people don't, it goes right over their head. They don't understand when I, when I talk like this, it goes right over their head. Like for example, in Colossians where, it, where apparent, it seems like Paul is saying, don't let anybody, he says, basically don't let anybody judge you for uh, the Sabbaths or the new moons or the festivals. So Christians today read that and say, oh, look at Paul says, don't let anybody judge you for the Sabbaths, the new moons and the festivals. So don't tell me to obey the Sabbath. Don't tell me to obey the festivals of the Lord. Don't tell me to obey that Torah because Paul says, don't let anybody judge you. But in the context of the book, Colossae, because you see, Paul wrote to, Col to the believers in Colossae. He didn't write to the Americans. In, in, the, in the 21st century, he wrote to the belief, some of his buddies that lived in Colossae, a city, in the first century. So you have to go back and say, oh, well, how, what was it, what, what was the context there? In Colossians, or in, in Colossae, in the first century, we know that it tells us, and even there's a lot of, we get, we get evidence of this in Colossians chapter 2 as well, where it was a city that was steeped in asceticism. In other words, this city believed that, that it was wrong to, to celebrate. It was wrong to have a festival, to, to, to feast. You had to go around with your head hung low and you had to be fasting as much as you possibly could. And you must, you have to be sorry, you know, in a very sober, somber state all the time, because to them that was humility. And that's why Paul spoke about the false humility in Colossians chapter two. You see, it makes, it all makes sense once you understand the context and so when Paul said to the believers, don't let anybody judge you for the, the Sabbaths and new moons or the festivals, it very well could be the opposite to what most Christians think it was. See, most Christians think that Paul was telling them, don't let anybody judge you for not obeying this. But that doesn't make sense. In the context, in, a, in the cultural context in which they, were, in which they lived, that would not make sense because if they did not obey the Sabbaths, the new moons and the festivals, which involved celebrations and feasts. So if they did not do that, why would anybody judge them for that? Because they did not believe in doing that anyway. They didn't believe the ascetic, the ascetics, those who were sold out to this whole, the asceticism thing going on there. They, thought it was wrong to celebrate and feast. That's wrong. You're not supposed to be happy. But you know, Jews today, they, they celebrate Sabbath according to the scriptures. It's a celebration. It's a party. You know, it's, they, they feast. The Sabbaths are feasts. The festivals of the Lord feast for the most part. So why, why would those living in Colossae judge the Christians, the believers, for not celebrating when they don't believe in celebrating anyway. It's more like it that they would be judging them for celebrating because that's, that's the doctrine of asceticism. You don't celebrate. You don't bake your challah on, on Shabbat. You don't, you don't, you don't have a celebration, a feast, all the festivals of the Lord. You don't do that. We're supposed to be somber. We're supposed to be like we're pickled in pickle juice. We've been baptized in lemon juice. So in the context of the culture, when Paul said to Colossae, assuming that it was, assuming that it was him that actually said it, what it seems to be saying is, don't let anybody 
judge you for doing it. As if these, these believers were actually doing it. They were obeying the Sabbaths. They were obeying the, the festivals of the Lord. You see? See, if they were obeying the Sabbaths and the festivals of the Lord, and they were celebrating and feasting and this kind of thing, then yeah, people would be apt to judge them. You see? Right? So in the same way, see, so the, the interpretation of the book of Colossians can be completely overturned if you understand the culture of Colossae. In the same way, the same thing could happen with the book of Galatians. Well, we don't know. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the problem was with these people in Galatia. Obviously, Paul had some kind of problem with them, some kind of thing, issue with them. The way he wrote Galatians doesn't seem to be too syrupy, sweet, and all nice and blessy, you know? So he had some kind of problem with them. We don't know exactly what it was. We don't know exactly what these people believed what they taught, what this, what the actual context was. So we, we need to understand that. So when, when Paul says, know that no one is justified by the works of the law, first of all, we need to ask the question, what does this phrase mean, works of the law? What does that mean? Because there are many different interpretations of that as well. One of the most convincing is that of the MMT. The MMT were a, a bunch of documents that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls alongside the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these documents that dated, predated the, the day of Paul, predated the, uh, the time of the first century, but yet they, uh, it's still relatively around the same time of, of the New Testament, you know, relatively speaking compared to us. I mean, we're 2,000 years removed from the fact compared to the Dead Sea Scrolls was not that far removed. And it was actually in the same part of the world, right? It's in the same, in the same culture, basically. So according to the MMT, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the works of the law were the rabbinic additions to the law and not the law itself the rabbinic additions to the law and not the law itself. Um, let me show you something here. Today we use the same kind of thing. See, now, Okay. Here's the thing. Paul does not define clearly what the works of the law are. In the MMT, it does. Works, the word works meant the writings of the law. Not the law itself, but the writings about the law, the rabbinic additions to the law. In other words, the writings from the rabbis of the ancient times, those rabbis writing things about the law, basically kind of a commentary or additions to the law, not the law itself being the works of the law. It's the same kind of idea as we use, we see this. Okay, this is the uh, talk about Josephus. The new complete works of Josephus. So this word works doesn't mean, you know, the obedience of, you know, of Josephus to the Torah, but rather it means the writings, the writings of Josephus. So in the same way, one could say that it's possible that the word works in the quote unquote works of the law means the writings about the law, but not the law itself. Okay. Very important to understand that we don't know everything here. We don't know what the Galatians, the, the culture and the context of this book of Galatians really is in here. 
the book of Galatians, as interpreted today and as it appears today from a 21st century Western point of view, it's a dumpster fire of theology. But maybe it had a lot more going for it back in the day with it in Galatia itself. So what does it mean by the works of the law? Does it mean the law itself? Or does it mean the writings about the law that the rabbis wrote, the additions to the law as we read in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Or is it what is it is it talking about the obedience to the law as most Christians think it is? If, I'll just say this, if this is talking about obedience to God, obedience to his instructions, obedience to the law, if that is what Paul ma- meant here, if that's what he meant, he is dead wrong. He's dead wrong. If he meant something else, then okay. I'm not going to... Uh, it, I will say, I'll go, I'll go as far as saying this. The way this is interpreted today in the 21st century is totally against the rest of the scriptures. It's totally against the law, totally against the prophets, totally against God, against what we read in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation talks a lot about obedience and, and all that kind of stuff. It's against what we read in the Gospels, especially the Synoptic Gospels, especially the Gospel of Matthew, it's against that. And this is the reason why Marcion, the, the man who first concocted the idea of gluing all these books together and putting them together in a, in a, in a canon per se, uh, making his own first Bible, including Paul and Luke, he rejected, uh, he didn't include the Gospel of Matthew in there no doubt, because he understood that Matthew, the teachings of Matthew, went against what Paul said, assuming that he knew that Matthew existed, which I don't think he, I can't see how he wouldn't know, seeing it was second century, and those books were already in circulation, and very well saturated, I would assume, anyway, very well saturated that part of the world by that time. And that's the reason why as well, you know, we got like Martin Luther uh, comes along like 1500 years after, well, 1400 years after Marcion and Martin Luther was a quasi Marcionite, right? He was a quasi Marcionite. Martin Luther was more of a Paulian than he was a Christian per se, because he, he loved the idea. He loved Paul's teachings and he rejected a fair amount of the New Testament, you know, Martin Luther. Yeah the father of the Protestant Reformation. Yes, he rejected a good, a good amount of the, of the New Testament books. James, Hebrews, Revelation, lots of other ones too. Um, why would he do that? Because he understood they're against Paul. He didn't try to make, he didn't try to reconcile it. He understood they were against Paul. So, Robert, What's the meaning of works of the law here? What does that mean? And how do you know? Faith in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? And how do you know? This word faith in the, in the Greek, pistis or pistuo, different variations of the same word, is the exact same word that the Septuagint uses to translate the Hebrew word amuna, especially when we find it in Habakkuk chapter 2, where it's talking about the, um, the just shall live by faith. Amuna. What does the word amuna mean? It means faithfulness and fidelity. What's my point? My point is this same word, faith, that we read so much in the New Testament, has its roots in the... Hebrew meaning faithfulness and fidelity. It doesn't mean just simply some kind of mental acknowledgement. It's actually doing something. Faithfulness. Obedience. Fidelity to God. Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus was a rabbi. 
What does it mean to have faith in a rabbi? Again, we have to go back to the culture in order to understand this properly. We have to go back as far as possible in time, as much as we possibly can in our own minds, to understand what does this mean. Even today, in modern days, uh, 21st century, if you were to go find a, uh, an Orthodox rabbi and you were to ask the rabbi, excuse me, rabbi, what does it mean to have faith in a rabbi? What does it mean? If I have faith in you, what does that mean, rabbi? What does that mean? Because Jesus was a rabbi. So what did it mean to have faith in Jesus? Not just to simply accept a bunch of dogma into your head. I don't think that's what it means. To have faith in a rabbi, I, I believe, to have faith in a rabbi means to go by his teachings and to follow his example. Go by his teachings and follow his example. What did Jesus teach according to the Synoptic Gospels? Torah. Torah. He taught Torah. And, you know, most Christians that I know of would tell you that Jesus was sinless, which means that he obeyed God. He did not sin against the Father, meaning that he obeyed the law. Most Christians would tell you that Jesus, if Jesus did anything, he obeyed the law of God. He, you know, so he, he obeyed the law. So his example was obedience to the Torah. So WWJD, what would Jesus do? Torah, that's what he would do. Went to the synagogues regularly and he obeyed Torah. So what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to have faith in, in Jesus? What is it? it means to have faith in a rabbi, historically speaking. Historically speaking, I'm not talking about your dogma. I'm talking about historically speaking and culturally speaking as well. So to have faith in Jesus was to have faith in a rabbi, which I believe means to go by his teachings and to follow his example. It says here, and we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith. Again, this word faith, faithfulness, fidelity, in Mashiach, and not by the works of the law. Again, what is this works of the law? What does it mean? Because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. Okay, so Robert do your homework. I'd like to know exactly what that means, works of the law, and how do you know? I will tell you this. If that phrase means obeying the Father, in other words, being sinless like Jesus, if that's what it means, then Paul could not be more wrong. Yeah, wrong that is, very wrong. But if it means something else, then maybe we can cut, cut some slack here. And again, how do we know what the context is here fully? Because we don't know. Paul did not write Galatians as a be-all, end-all, all-inclusive book of doctrine. Rather, he was following up with what these people were already uh, dealing with and what they were already teaching or being taught and, and practicing in the culture and context in which they lived. So, at the end of the day, we have a lot of information missing here that is pretty much irretrievable. We cannot get it. Unless you, if you can get it, Robert, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you, Robert, to hear, to know what the answer is to these questions. Okay. I promised John here. Thank you, John, for your patience. Appreciate you. So I'm sure you're familiar with the Ethiopian Bible, which has over 80 books. Uh, was this canon established before or after the 66 and 73 book canons had come along? Very, very good question, John. Appreciate that question. Uh, the short answer is, I don't know. And the reason why I would say that is because of some of these books, I don't even know what, what the, some of these books are, let alone when they were written. Because some of these appear to have been written in the quote-unquote New Testament age, which would, uh, which would lead us to believe that, um, that they could have been written, who knows, in the first century, second century, third century, who knows when they were written. 
Um, very good question. Here's the Ethiopian website, Ethiopian Orthodox website to be exact. Uh, I'll just click on English here. Uh, and uh, canonical books on the side, we have the canonical books of the so-called Old Testament there. And then we got these books of the New Testament, which includes some of these ones here I am not really aware of. John, like the Surat Sion, the Book of Order, and the Tizaz, and the Gitsu, and the Abtilis, and the first book of Dominoes, and the second book of Dominoes, and Book of Clement, which is not the same as the, the writings of Clement from the early church fathers, and the Didascalia. So I, I, I'm not uh, well aware of when the last of these books were written. So um, I would dare say that it was well established, I would assume, Okay, that this was established before the 66 book, because the 66 book is relatively new. The 66 book canon was relatively new. Uh, you know, 73 book canon, from what I understand, is a little bit older than that. I would, I would, I would think that this would be older, but I might be wrong. I might be wrong, John. And not, I'm not even sure how anybody can find out. I I was on a mission uh, years ago to obtain some of these books, and it's it's almost impossible to get these books. At least it was several years ago. I'm not sure about now. So, John, very good question. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, give you more information about that. That is as much as I know. Excellent. Thank you, John, for asking. Red says, uh, you remember when I said we pagans don't have laws? I remember that, Red. says, well, these laws I'm speaking about are moral laws. We, we think very freely like an atheist. Okay, yeah. yeah everybody, I, I, thanks, Red. I appreciate that. You know, everybody, including Christians who say they don't have laws, because Christians say the same kind of thing, right? They say, oh, we don't go by the law at all. It's not by the law. It's only by grace. Uh, Everybody has laws. Everybody does. Even, you know, the, the most quote-unquote lawless out there, they still have a certain sense of what they should do, what they shouldn't do. They have their own conscience, uh, at least I hope. Even those who don't have a conscience, they still have some kind of laws to go by, or else you wouldn't, you wouldn't be alive very long if you didn't. You have to have some laws to go by. Even if it's just the laws of physics, I mean, you know, you have to have some laws to go by, or else you're, you wouldn't be able to live uh, very long at all. Yeah, thanks, Red. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Voice of One, good to see you. Welcome. Blessings, blessings over there on TikTok. Okay, so, um, yeah. Last call here for any of you guys who have any questions, prayer requests, let me know in the live chat. Uh, we're going to get into some critical thinking talk in just a minute. Very interesting topic tonight. That is the making stuff up fallacy. I love it. I love it. So we're going to talk about that just for a few minutes. Then we're going to do our critical thinking quiz as well. Once again, guys, if you haven't already, please leave a like, subscribe, and follow. If you haven't already, maybe you're in the shadows back there maybe you're in the shadows and you're watching this but you're not uh, active in the live chat hey just if you like any of this stuff if you like talking about the things of history things of scripture uh, all this kind of stuff like that uh, things of god make sure you like make sure you have a uh, make sure you're following subscribed we do this every single day by the grace of god this is thursday so we are going to be live Lord willing, tomorrow night and also Saturday. On so tomorrow night we'll be we'll be live at 7 p.m. Eastern, and on Saturday we will be live at 2 p.m. Eastern with the band again. With the band, we've been practicing as as much as we as much as we can squeeze time out to do that. To make sure that we're at our best for you guys. So make sure you don't miss that. Okay. Here we are. 
the ad hoc rescue. Oh yeah, I get this all the time. I get this all the time. And I know you guys do too as well. The ad hoc rescue. I'm reading from logicallyfallacious.com. Also known as making stuff up or MSU fallacy. Description. Very often we desperately want to be right and hold on to certain beliefs. Despite any evidence pre presented to the contrary. Despite any evidence presented to the contrary. Hmm. As a result, we begin to make up excuses as to why our belief could still be true and is still true, despite the fact that we have no real evidence for what we are making up. I'll read the examples here in just a moment. Uh, these, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these things are things that I read for the first time here. So logical form of this fallacy is claim, claim X is true because of evidence Y. Then someone's like, well, evidence Y is demonstrated not to be acceptable evidence. Therefore, it must be, therefore it must be guess Z then even though there is no evidence for guess Z. I'll read that again. Claim X is true because of evidence Y. Evidence Y is demonstrated not to be acceptable evidence. Therefore, it must be guess Z then, even though there is no evidence for guess Z. Example, Frida says, I just know that Raymond is just wa waiting to ask me out. Edna says, He's been, see, he's been seeing Rose for three months now. Frida says, he is just seeing her to make me jealous. Edna says, they're engaged. Frida says, well, that's just his way of making sure I know about it. Okay, so this is just the making stuff up fallacy, right? The MSU fallacy. Making stuff up. We get this so much here, don't we? Explanation. Besides being a bit deluded... Poor Frida refuses to accept the evidence that leads to a truth she's not ready to accept. As a result, she creates an ad hoc reason in an attempt to rescue her initial claim. There we go. We get this a lot. We get this a lot when we're talking to people about their beliefs and the scriptures and all that kind of thing. Example two, Mark says, the president of the USA is the worst president ever because unemployment has never been so bad before. Sam says, actually, it was worse in 1982 and far worse in the 1930s. Besides, the president might only be partly responsible for the economy during his term. Mark says, well, the president kicks animals when nobody's looking. Expl the explanation is... Out of desperation, Mark makes a claim about the president's private treatment of animals after his original claim has been refuted. There's an exception, of course. Proposed, proposing possible solutions is perfectly acceptable when an argument is suggesting only a possible solution, especially in a hypothetical situation. For example, if there is no God, then life is meaningless. If there is no God who dictates meaning to our lives, perhaps we are truly free to find our own meaning. Uh, tip, when you suspect people are just making stuff up, rather than providing evidence to support their claim, simply ask them, what evidence do you have to support that? Yeah, like we ask this a lot here. Like, how do you know? What kind of evidence do you have? You have good evidence to support your claim or are you just making stuff up? And it seems like we have so many people today who actually do make stuff up. I get it. I get it. You know, you make a claim and it gets refuted and it seems like it's, it seems like it's not a good claim. And so you must do damage control to, uh, to support the claim by making stuff up. 
But uh, yeah, it's not a very good practice to do that. Okay. So our critical thinking quiz. Red says, all we do is respect our fellow pagans and take the wisdom of our superior. And we make that a living. Uh, nothing like Christianity, no repentance, no street preaching or sanctification. Well, you know what, Red? There's a lot of Christians out there that don't believe in any of that. Uh, I, I had a pastor visit me, actually. Um, this was, oh, this was a while ago now, maybe a good 10 years ago. And he didn't believe in repentance. Actually, there's a couple of, a couple of pastors that actually believe that visited me that did not believe in repentance or, well, I don't know about street preaching, but there's one that said, well, actually there's a lot that don't believe in street preaching. You think about how many... I'm not sure where you where you are, what city you are, but if you're anywhere in the West, you probably have you're probably in a city with a fair amount of churches in it. So most of these churches don't believe in street preaching either, or else they'd be on a, they'd be out on the street, which is only you know one in I don't know one in seems like one in five hundred churches maybe are out on the street anymore. It's not it's hardly ever there. Yeah. If you have, I, I would think that everybody has some kind of moral laws. I mean, if I think even animals have certain kind of moral laws. There might be somebody out there that, do, that doesn't have moral laws, like somebody who really doesn't have a soul, really doesn't have a conscience. Uh, and that is uh, not a very good thing. But I think even them, they... I, I I I have met a lot of bad people. I spent a fair amount of time out on the street myself before I walked with God, okay? I spent a fair amount of I've seen some really I've seen some some wicked stuff. And even these even the most wicked person I can think about has some kind of moral laws. They do. They may or may not uh, admit it, but they do. They have some sense of what is right. Some sense of what is wrong. Yeah, thanks, Red. Appreciate that. Just Shuren says Paul followed Cain, Balaam, and Korah. I think I got a little bit of an idea where you uh, where you get that from. Uh, is that do you get this idea from a book of Revelation? Is that where you're getting it from? Yeah. Oh, I see. Sorry, Jashurin. I see. I just saw here that your message was retracted. My apologies. If you guys, if you guys retract a message, uh, the the software that I'm using it doesn't register. It doesn't sync up with the software. So, my apologies for that. Okay. In that case, don't worry about answering that. All right. So anyways, critical thinking quiz of the night. If six puzzle makers can compose nine puzzles in a day and a half, how many puzzle makers does it take to compose 270 puzzles in 30 days? Ooh. If six puzzle makers can compose nine puzzles in a day and a half, how many puzzle makers does it take to compose 270 puzzles in 30 days? Yeah, that that's something to... Think about there. Leave that with you for a moment. Okay. 
Okay. If six puzzle makers can compose nine puzzles in a day and a half, how many puzzle makers does it take to compose 270 puzzles in 30 days? What do we think here? Give me a minute there to think about that. If six puzzle makers can compose nine puzzles in a day and a half, how many puzzle makers does it take to compose 270 puzzles in 30 days? Randy says nine. Randy says nine. Anybody else want to take a shot at this one here? Give you guys a few more minutes. I think there's a few of you that would be is working on this. 
Right? And he says, or whatever Kalamantle says. Well, that's, that's right. Yeah, Flo says 13. 13. Okay. Let's see what else we have here. Let me give you guys a few more minutes. I know there's a few of you that are still working on this. Oh, Kalimantos. We see Kalimantos says nine. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'll give you guys maybe just one more minute here. One more minute. Okay, I'll let you guys know what the answer is here in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the answer is 9 puzzle makers. Each puzzler composed one puzzle per day. Wow. Amazing. You guys are awesome. Randy, you were the first one to come to, to get it right off the bat. Nine. Awesome job. Congratulations, Randy. Awesome. Awesome. And Kalamantos as well. Got it as well. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. You guys are awesome and good. Good show flow. Yeah. Flow says I took a wild guess. Well, yeah, good, uh, good going. Good job, everyone, says Chad One True King. Yes, amen, amen. You guys are amazing. You guys are awesome. All right. That's awesome. Randy, excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah, Calamento says, yay, Randy. Yeah, all right. That was really good. Good stuff. Got it like that. Wow. All right. Well, thanks everyone. You guys are amazing. You guys are awesome. We'll see you, Lord willing, tomorrow night. So tomorrow night, again, is air of Shabbat already. It's already been, wow, these weeks are flying by like crazy. Yeah, so we'll see you guys again tomorrow evening. That's Friday. For those of you who are new here again, um, I know that there are some, at least it, I think it shows me that there are some in the lurking in the backgrounds there. Um, make sure you leave a like, make sure you follow, subscribe. We do this every single day. Talk about all these kind of things, um, the things of God. We pull out the Bible, pull out the scriptures, 
talk about the things of history. We want to dig for the truth. We want to know the truth, really. This is what we're all about and critical thinking to keep our minds sharp at, while we're doing this. I think it's amazing. Uh, yeah, uh, Q&A, great fellowship, um, all that kind of stuff, praying for, for each other. Uh, you guys are awesome. All right. So anyways, guys. We'll see you again tomorrow evening. That's tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern. And, I'll, and also, again, in case there's some of you that are not going to be available tomorrow, we are, we're going to be back 2 p.m. on Saturday. Not 7, but 2 p.m. on Saturday with, again, Lord willing, the, the band as well. So live music and all that kind of good stuff as well. Great fellowship. You guys are awesome. Love you guys. Amazing people. All right. Okay. Red says, I can't even see what people are saying in the chat. Okay. All right, Red. Yeah. Good to see you. Randy says, thank you all. Thank you, Randy. Blessings, blessings. Oh, Red says, like the chat moves no longer for me besides my own comments. Oh, I'm not sure what's going on there, Red. You might want to check uh, your settings there somewhere. Yeah. Anyways, good to see you guys. Channel One True King says, good job, Randy. Yes. And Flo says, thank you, Chris. Uh, and all, see you next time. Thank you, Flo. Yes. Blessings, blessings to you and yours. Channel One True King says, thank you for your time, Christopher. Thank you as well, Channel One True King. You guys are amazing. Okay. As always, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen, amen. I'll see you guys tomorrow.